What if a company wasn't afraid to say, what if? What if the last 200 years was just the start of what you could be tomorrow? What if you were driven by tech so you could redefine the world of transportation? And what if you cared just as much about the greater good as you cared about the goods you delivered? Imagine what that would do for safety, for efficiency. Imagine the impact you could have well beyond your own tracks. At Norfolk Southern, we're going to work every day, looking ahead, making bold plans, asking what if. Because that's how you reimagine possible. Good evening, everyone. I'm Tom Kulaga, Executive Creative Director of the New York Times Live Conversation Series, Times Talks. We are thrilled to present tonight's Times Talks event here at the beautiful Carnegie Institution for Science on the timely and important topic of America's infrastructure and the role that new technology can play in revitalizing it. I want to give special thanks to Norfolk Southern, the sponsor of tonight's event. And now it's my pleasure to introduce John Scheib, Executive Vice President, Law and Administration, and Chief Legal Officer for Norfolk Southern. Thank you very much, Tom. Norfolk Southern is proud to host tonight's gathering of thought leaders to discuss the profound effect of rapidly evolving transportation technologies and the effect they will have on our world. As a leading freight railroad, Norfolk Southern already offers one of the safest, most efficient, most environmentally friendly ways to move goods. Yet we understand that constant technological innovation will be essential for addressing the mounting economic, environmental, and infrastructure challenges that our nation will face. By 2040, the United States will see a 40% increase in national freight shipments. 40%. To meet the future head on, Norfolk Southern has challenged ourselves to reimagine possible, to think differently about every aspect of our operation, exploring how innovative new approaches can help us to serve our customers, the communities we touch, and the economy we support. Our team is already hard at work unlocking the potential from advances in big data, machine learning, smart sensors, and automation. To be successful, however, collaboration will be vital. That's why we're excited to pursue this vision with other technology leaders, both inside our industry and outside, while also working closely with the United States Department of Transportation to explore more flexible, nimble, and forward-looking regulatory approaches that can further unleash private innovation. Tonight's discussion will help advance that change and leave us all asking how we can harness transportation technology to embrace the challenge and promise of tomorrow and how we can truly reimagine possible. Tom, thank you, and we look forward to the panel. Thank you, John. And now on to our program. We've assembled a world-class panel to talk about the intersection of tech and infrastructure. Moderating tonight's event is Cecilia Kang, New York Times National Technology Correspondent. Her recent memorable stories include everything from Facebook's data scandals to the AT&T Time Warner merger to how Northern Virginia avoided the pitfalls that fell the Amazon HQ2 deal in New York City. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Cecilia and our panelists, Anthony Fox, Chief Policy Officer at Lyft, Barbara Humpton, CEO of Siemens USA, Representative Josh Gottheimer of New Jersey, and Shannon Valentine, Secretary of Transportation for the Commonwealth of Virginia. so much for joining us tonight. We have such an esteemed panel, so many people here who are representing the private sector and who've worked extensively in the public sector and some who do now to continue to do today. I'd like to start off and kind of dream about the future and hear from Anthony. In 10 years, how are we and our stuff 
going to get moved around. How do you think we are going to be driving? Will we have our own cars? Will those cars be flying? Will we ever have to park again or buy gas? Will we get groceries and diapers by drone or some other method that we haven't even figured out yet? And what will it take to get there? Mm. Well, first of all, thank you. Thank the New York Times and Norfolk Southern for this wonderful event held on such a slow news day. <laughs> <laughs> uh, We're shocked you're here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you're ready for the yeah. cocktail hour. <laughs> um, changes in transportation happen relatively glacially. Um, and yet we're in a period of rapid transformation in technology in transportation, which I think over the next 10 years is going to be realized at a very rapid rate. Uh, within 10 years, I would say um, the average person in America should be able to uh, access an autonomous vehicle. Uh, I think the trillion dollars we're spending annually on car ownership cars that are used about 95% of, uh, of the time, idle 95% of the time, I think individuals will start rationalizing that decision and start to buy trips rather than buying the car as much. And so I think that we will change our own attitudes about personal mobility in that way. I also think enterprising cities will rethink the urban landscape and think about ways to maximize the choices people have to move around whether that's walking, biking, uh, using these scooters, or getting in a car, or taking a transit trip, or what have you. I think the more choices people have to get to the same place, the more we can decongest and deconflict some of the infrastructure we have. Our freight system is going to be overtaxed. Um, it, is, it is a significant problem for us, and we can talk about that later, but I think we've got some major challenges there as well. To get to that vision, Barbara, um, so much needs to be done. Uh, we had a conversation earlier about even just if you want to go all electric, like some states do, to put in the charging stations even into <coughs> any particular state is an enormous task. That's just one of many different things that need to, do on, need to be done on the infrastructure side. What are you seeing from Siemens um, in terms of as you look forward at this future that Anthony just described, what needs to be put in place? Yeah, it's pretty exciting, actually. Um, in fact, stop and think a minute. Who all knows what Moore's Law is? Moore's Law, the idea that you can double the capacity on a chip every two years or so. Up until now, infrastructure has been analog. Infrastructure has been something we build with concrete and tarmac. And, and instead, we're now bringing digital tools to the table. So what happens if suddenly infrastructure could follow Moore's law? Think about the power of what we could be providing. So we start today with the simple connectivity. And I'll give you an example, Amtrak. Amtrak, we build Amtrak's lo locomotives and we've put sensors on those locomotives. Think about 800 data points. Did I lose you? Yeah. My problem. Think about, think about about 800 data points. Every time this uh, locomotive is pulling into a station, we're able to collect that data and, and, and analyzing it. And over the last several years, have reduced delays on the Northeast Corridor by over 30%. We have the power of data just entering this space. And I think that's where we're going to start to see massive transportation. And that's where we're going to be putting our time and attention. We need to bring Moore's Law to Congress. <laughs> we'll just get everything done. It'll be easy. It may need more than just that equation. Right? Know, maybe, maybe. 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 You know, and, and Josh, like, as I hear this, it's, it's all very exciting to envision this future. Um, driving on the Beltway this morning, I just have seen no change in my transportation situation <clears throat> um, from even decades ago. In fact, it feels even more congested. Um, and in fact, I think that's true, right? Yeah, Our true. traffic is, is more, more congested. congested. That's where that trend has continued. Um, so it's hard to see this happen. And it's hard to see, it's hard to feel very optimistic, actually, when you see really big moonshot projects, like a high-speed rail project in California, unwind really you know mm -hmm. and as you know I'm sure you've heard of this project that was supposed to connect San Francisco to Los Angeles now it's basically connecting Central Valley California to Central Valley California um, lots of reasons behind that and I know there's, there's a project in New Jersey that you're very interested in as well 
what's going on with these big projects? It's, it's very, it's, the technology is there, it's possible. Can the U.S. actually execute these huge moonshot infrastructure ideals? Well, I think we have to, uh, but you're facing two issues, right? You've got old and new. The, the old infrastructure that we use every single day that we need to get to work and get home to see our kids, we have to deal with that, and, we, and it's crumbling. You know, a third of the bridges are considered unsafe in the state of New Jersey, and we've got the eighth worst roads in the, in the country because the resources aren't there to invest. The tunnel you talk about between New York and New Jersey is 108 years old. It's literally falling apart, and Superstorm Sandy really did it in, and I, I took a ride through it recently. You can see on you know, a, a slow train, we took this observatory train, you can see it crumbling. And, and wires everywhere, it's a mess. And if one of those shuts down, it's a $100 million a day impact on the, on the regional economy. It's 20% of our GDP runs through that region in the country. And yet we treat it, we keep, with all infrastructure, just keep kicking, it, kicking the can down. And I'm looking at it and saying, when we rebuild this, like when we do Amtrak, how do we make sure that it's got all the sensors? Because think about how many, you need to have new rail. If we're gonna bring high-speed rail, just like California, into the Northeast, you actually have to change the tracks out in the tunnel. Right, you have to make, you have to add all the sensors in so that you can go faster um, and even have broad, if anyone's traveled between New York and uh, DC and New York on the train, half the time you can't even get a phone call done or have internet connectivity. Well, that seems pretty basic that we can't figure out. And if we can't figure that out, you know, so part of this is the old stuff and then the new stuff with all the drive, with driverless vehicles and autonomous vehicles and thinking through what the secretary said, we need to have policies that are thinking that through and not state by state patchwork, but actually have a system so that when you drive from New York to New Jersey or across the country, your car will work when you go from one state to the next state. Right? Mm -hmm. All these things have to be thought through from a policy perspective, but don't worry, we're really good at Congress. We're fast. You know? So, I mean, so <laughs> that's, you know, that's the challenge of how do we do right. this in a divided government. Well, I, I think you're, you're hitting on the, the key point here. This was supposed to be a bipartisan issue. You've heard since this administration came in, infrastructure, infrastructure, and on both sides of the aisle, you hear the agreement on the need for, for changes in, and funding. of So what's happening? What's the conversation in Washington? <laughs> okay. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and we to, we I know everybody, Shannon. everybody, no, every, actually Democrats and Republicans, yes. you know, I co-chair a bipartisan caucus, but it's not just there, it's everywhere. Everybody ag agrees we need to deal with infrastructure, but it's water and broadband and, and, and roads and bridges and tunnels. But the question, of course, is always, okay, well, how do you pay for it? And that's where, really where it, it breaks down every single time was how do you make this investment, even though we all know we need to. Um. Secretary Valentine Shannon, yeah. um, as far as infrastructure goes and transportation changes, um, Virginia, I think you can take a little bit of a victory lap because you were able to tout your transportation system and infrastructure um, in a way that actually lured Amazon to come to Northern Virginia. Talk about a little bit about what, how transportation and infrastructure played into that bid and why Amazon saw that as an important part of its piece for a second headquarters. Um, thank you, um, and thank you everyone for coming out tonight. Um, yes, it's very exciting to listen to all of you. I couldn't wait to hear what, <laughs> what we were gonna do at the federal level because we deal with all of these issues at the state level as well. When we were working with Amazon, there were really three things that <coughs> I would just point out to you briefly. One was, um, I don't know how many of you in the audience, but last year, um, Maryland, DC and Virginia were able to come to a Metro funding resolution. Metro and in, in, um, DC, Maryland, Virginia needed $500 million of investment, new money, just to try to restore the <coughs> mass transit system to the state of good repair. No one thought we could do it in a year. So this was last January, a year ago. And there was a really strong commit commitment among um, all three jurisdictions that we really needed to do this. And I think that cooperation um, kind of laid the foundation for what this region could do for business. And so we all actually agreed that regardless of if 
Amazon chose to come to the Washington metropolitan area, it would be a win for all of us. So we went into it with that attitude. I will tell you that within the Commonwealth of Virginia, there was remarkable cooperation among the state officials, General Assembly, the governor's office, localities, the city of Alexandria, the county, the county of Arlington, all working together to try to put together a package that was really performance-based. <laughs> Amazon would have to produce in order for us to make the commitment back to them. From a transportation perspective, I took a little bit of a different um, look at this. Rather than just coming to the table thinking, oh, well, we'll try to do this and gathering money, I really went to, and looked across our entire transportation sector. And in Virginia, that includes 66 airports, the Port of Virginia. We have a spaceport that launches rockets to the unmanned space station, roads, bridges, highways, uh, transit, rail, um, uh, bike paths, pedestrian, barges, ferries. And I looked across what we were doing in Northern Virginia. And when you looked at all the investments over the next six years that were already programmed and on the table, there's $15 billion mm -hmm. that we are making in transportation, in, um, investing in transportation infrastructure for everyone who lives in this region and for any business that's here and for any business looking at us. So I did not have to go to the General Assembly and say, oh my gosh, I need this money. We were making a commitment from already. the beginning that we were already going to do this. Um, so we were trying, we knew we couldn't build our way out of the congestion crisis that yeah. we all face. Um, it was really trying to transform it into a multimodal platform. So in our negotiations with Amazon, it was really looking at those last mile connections. It was trying to make a certain site work um, with two... Um, metro station entrances, expanding transit, a connector bridge to Reagan National, and improvements along Route 1. So it was very focused. <laughs> Are you going to keep the jobs there? Because if you don't want them, we take them in now, Jersey. <laughs> no, we've already called New York. <laughs> because actually, we, we are really planning for this, and we're planning for more. But we're, we're happy to share. Well, you can always move, too. Northern Virginia. <laughs> I love it. Can I, can I just Please, jump in jump here? In. Because... Siemens has a cities team, and when you go and interact with um, cities and the city leadership, what you discover is this is a real competition, just like what we're hearing, a real competition for talent. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea of what it's going to take to attract residents to our region, and having transportation be central to that, obviously that's key. What we're finding also hand in hand with that is the desire for greater sustainability and greater air quality. So everyone needs the digital connections that you've mentioned. And if, what we're finding is that if you can put together a plan for power, for communications, and then, of course, these integrated services, then that creates the kind of environment that today's real talent is looking to be part of. Which makes me feel like, actually, Josh, if you can't even resolve a very basic infrastructure problem, a very old tunnel that absolutely needs upgrades, how can you attract? Not me, but... Yeah. <laughs> Portland, but the uh, state of New Jersey yeah. um, and the region. It's a real risk that there's going to be some divides in this country as we go forward, and the kind of talents and the companies that you can attract in residence. It, it is one of the things, and I'll defer to the secretary here, but it's one of the things that I hear about all the time from our businesses, from our companies, when we're trying to get them to grow and come to New Jersey, uh, they say, it, uh, the commute's killing us, or we're mm. concerned about right. getting between New York and New Jersey. What if the tunnel goes down, as, this, as the chairman of Amtrak has said, within the next five years is a real possibility. What do we do then? And commuting time is real for people, and, and it affects productivity, and we, we know the impact. The investment, the return on investment is so clear and so there, just like having super fast broadband, which we have, but you know, if you're sitting in traffic, it's a real problem. And Mr. Secretary, I don't know. That's right. Yeah, I would just say, um, I'm glad that we're talking about this because I spent a good part of my life trying to get people's attention around the future challenges of infrastructure. And there are several dirty little secrets about infrastructure. One of them has been touched on already, which is that in our system in the U.S. of federalism, you have to have agreement at the federal, state, and local level, particularly on these major projects. And if you think about the Gateway Tunnel, we had a moment in 2010, 2011, where New York was on board, the Port Authority was on board, the administration was on board, New Jersey wasn't on board. 
I mean the governor. Of the other party. <laughs> <laughs> then. Sorry, I just, you know. Yeah, then, for clarity. Clarity. We took another stab at it. The administration was on board. Uh, Port Authority was on board. Amtrak was on board. New Jersey was on board. New York was hesitant. <clears throat> And so, you know, really you have to like hit a, 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 you know, home run, a full home run with everybody on base to be able to solve these problems. And, and I think that is, people say, well, why does China have high speed rail? Why does Japan have high speed rail? Well, the reason is because the national government is actually building those things or making those things happen. And in our system, the national government doesn't do that. So I think one of the things to kind of like solve this is that a transportation bill that puts more money into a system that is broken in its decision-making chain mm -hmm. has to be changed. And so we need a category of federal projects, probably on the freight side, that would just be done by the federal government in conjunction with states. We need to plus up what states are getting so they can take care of the, the road system primarily. And we need to push more money into cities and make that money flexible so that the multimodal development in those urban areas uh, can, can get better. The last thing I'll say is if you looked at a heat map of where growth is happening in the country, it's really interesting. You have old systems in the Northeast and the Midwest of transit that are falling apart. Uh, we've had issues here in Washington, D.C. famously with the WMATA system. Those systems need to be improved. They're 90 billion dollars worth of backlog maintenance just for those systems. But if you looked at where most of the growth is happening in the country, it's happening in the Southeast and the Western United States, where there is not as much of a tradition of multimodalism. So we have this massive problem of trying to create more options in these areas that are fast growing and maintaining the systems that we have that have been historically used. That is table stakes for the future. It's not even getting us ahead. It's actually just trying to keep, keep up, up with what we have to go. And along those lines, I mean, you're, you're hitting on freight and, and some of the transportation of things, as we say. Where is the technology and where are the bottlenecks? It sounds like a lot of the bottlenecks you're saying is actually in terms of approvals and funding. Um, and what are you seeing as well, Barbara, on that? Do you well, want to start? We, we, we're the envy of the world in terms of our freight uh, railroad system you know, because it, it's highly private and it's supported by the private sector and they're investing a ton of money every year. But even with that, a package that goes from the port of Los Angeles to Chicago might take two days, might still take two days for that package to get through Chicago because of the bottlenecks. And as we look over the next 20 or 30 years, the systems that we use, whether it's rail, highway, or what have you to move freight, they're going to be overtaxed in, in the future, like by a substantial percentage. So um, to how to solve that through technology, I think, um, I think, number one, we've got to put the money in to expand capacity in those systems that we can anticipate are going to be needing uh, that growth. And that's some of our long distance highways, that's some of our uh, rail systems. Um, I think we're going to see with technology some, some different ways of moving things, um, you know, uh, how drones will affect their delivery of goods to rural America, for example, could be dramatically better. A trip that might take hours can take minutes. Um, and I think that's where you may see some of the, the early improvements in delivery uh, there. So I think we've got some technology things that are coming, but they're not here yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually we've been piloting s several of these ideas um, just in dealing with the two problems. One is what to do inside cities. And in fact, um, Anthony, you helped us, uh, we, you selected us years ago for a pilot in, in Tampa mm -hmm. to look at connected infrastructure and connected transportation systems. The idea that within the city environment where there's so much congestion, can you actually uh, alleviate congestion and, and speed transportation by sharing data, uh, both with signaling, yeah. with awareness of pedestrians, et cetera, et cetera. Successful pilots so far. Uh, probably, you know, it, I would say very promising for what we're going to see in the future in autonomous driving and how that's mm -hmm. going to affect our downtowns. Um, I love this question about what do we do in rural America? Because quite frankly, we have the issue of, you know, what are the big freight loads that are going to be transported by rail? 
right? If coal has been the predominant freight that has really supported our freight rail lines, with the change that's going on in our energy, obviously that's going to have an impact. I saw a really neat thing you might enjoy taking a look at. Um, look up Zipline. Uh, to, to see technology that's been used in Africa where there's very limited rural infrastructure and during rainy seasons, you know, just un unpassable infrastructure. And we've got a customer who has used our software to help create a drone that will fly medical supplies out into rural areas. So I, I agree with you that, that we're going to have a combination of solutions here, and, and it's possible now because mm -hmm. of our ability to do real integration in, in that digital world. Uh, but I think it's going to take, you have to invest to grow, obviously, in these, one of these cases, and I think you're right, Anthony, you have to do that. And you have to be able to think of what we need to fix in the short term, the, the fixes, right, just to catch up, but then how do we make sure we have good policy and then we work with the, the private sector and the public sector working smartly together, right. as you're doing, to actually allow it to go and to experiment and to, because certainly if we rely on government, forget it alone, right? It's just not gonna happen. We've done best where we've worked in tandem, I think in so many cases, especially on the innovation front. And I think we need to make sure we, we set up the right environment for it. We deal with challenges, like parts of my district that don't have broadband, right? Because that if you're gonna, a lot of this is gonna require 5G, if, right? Or, or it's gonna require at least um, up, upgrades the infrastructure, broadband infrastructure. How do we make sure we create a great environment for it so it can all thrive? And, and, all, and all the companies that have built our country, or helped build our country can do what they need to do. I mean, that, that to me is really the role of government. We've got to invest in places and also we have to make sure that we stay out of the way in certain places and create the right environment for growth. 5G is a great example of, of infrastructure of the future. That, well, it's, it's literally invisible. You can't really see it's the mobile broadband infrastructure that we will need. Shannon and Josh or whoever can weigh in on this. Um, what is 5G? Can you just quickly explain what is important, what is it, why is it so important to the smart city of the future? Um, and I will get to that. Yeah. I was just listening to the conversation. I, I wanted, I, I feel somewhat fortunate because, you know, I have the Commonwealth in Virginia, so I'm a bit of a microcosm of many yeah. of the, the issues that you all are raising. But over the last four or five years in Virginia, we really have transformed a lot of transportation decision making. We use data to actually choose our, our transportation pro, um, projects to prioritize them across Virginia, urban, and um, as well as the rural communities. So there's a competitive process for how we do it. We've made a commitment to the state of good repair, and that is maintaining the 45% of all new construction money goes into state of good repair, so that we are trying to maintain the assets that we have. Um, we have reformed the P3 process, the public-private partnership, because I don't believe we're going to be able to address the major safety congestion mobility issues without that collaborative partnership with the private sector. As we have come in, I've only been in this position for a year. I was on the Commonwealth Transportation Board the last four. But coming into this position, we're really building on it with execution. We have to deliver um, uh, these pro we have 3,700 projects, $21 billion that we are executing. So we have to do that extremely well. We're a business. Um, tying transportation decisions to economic development in the rural areas, competitiveness in our larger areas, and embracing innovation. Um, one of the things I was able to do early on this past year was open an office of innovation that crossed the entire secretariat from rail and highways and airports and the port, bringing that um, innovation and possibilities together. And it's so great to have it housed somewhere and accountable. So as we are looking, um, you know, transportation today, we're actually moving people, goods, data, and information. We have to make all of this connect. So 5G, the next evolution from 4G, 4G LTE, the cellular, the wireless, the um, uh, under the uh, President Obama's administration, a real emphasis on dedicated, short-range communications, mm -hmm. um, D DSRC. DSRC. Yeah. So I know the acronym. Um, we, how we are looking at it, as the private sector is actually driving many of these decisions about what the communications. Um, 
uh, which con uh, communication system is actually going to be the most viable, what is actually going to emerge with autonomous or automated vehicles, we're trying to create the platform upon which it will work. We want to be ready for whatever that communication mm -hmm. signal is. The um, uh, intelligent transportation systems, the connected quarters, all the emerging trends and technologies, the, um, the momentum for energy efficiency and electric cars. We don't believe we can pick the winners and losers. We just want to be in a position to support business in the private sector and universities. So I really, so it's that partnership for us. We're the platform for the economy is how we kind of perceive our role. You know, my observation though, on the, the private and public partnership is absolutely key. And in my reporting, I found that actually a lot of the companies like to go to the places where there's the least regulation. And that ends up oftentimes firing back in the face of the company. And I'll, I'll just, a, a quick example, it was in Pittsburgh, um, Bill Peduto, the mayor there, has a very forward-looking, innovative, like um, embracing technology point of view. And he told Uber when he, they first came, red carpet, our red carpet, in, in, um, our, we're rolling out the red carpet and that means no regulation. And the compass, so several driverless companies came in and started testing. But then actually, residents started saying, but wait, we should get some of the data that Uber's collecting as they experiment and drive millions of miles around our city. I'm exaggerating, but thousands and thousands of miles. Um, then the sorts of the, the relationship started to fray. Can you talk a little bit, and actually, Anthony's a great example of somebody, one of the very few people who've worked, who's been a mayor, as well as a federal regulator, as well as now in the private sector. How do you make sure that those relationships start off right and that there's not a patchwork of those kinds of things that happen? You see the similar cases in Arizona, for example, with driverless cars in Phoenix, where that no regulation point of view has actually really wrinkled a lot of, wrinkled a lot of the, the residents. They don't like that idea. Yeah, so it's a great question, and uh, there's sort of two facets of it to me. First of all, I can't speak for Uber. Uh, <laughs> uh, Go ahead. Uh, uh, but uh, the first is that there are entire areas where regulation is needed for us to seize this future we're talking about. And one really, really good example is at the federal level on autonomous vehicles. Um, you know, today, the operational aspects of driving a car are separated from the physical car itself. So we have this set of standards at the federal level that govern what a vehicle should contain, what safety standards exist. And then we have your local DMV, where we all enjoy going and spending four hours, uh, <laughs> where uh, they try to figure out whether you're capable of operating a car. Well, what happens when the car is operating itself? Who, who is supposed to regulate that operational function? And it was our view in the Obama administration that that operational function was part of the safety function at the federal level. And if that's true, which we believe it was, then you could actually create a, a set of safety standards at the federal level that would, that would obviate the need for different state patchwork laws to come into to being, and it would provide a lot more certainty. Um, I think our goal was to get Congress to say explicitly that that was okay. We believed it was okay, but it'd be nice to have Congress say so. And I think that's still something that's being discussed in, in Congress today. At the local level, um, you know, these issues around data mm -hmm. also raise issues around privacy. Um, and, um, you know, I think the conversation is still gestating around different parts of the country. I think people are, the cities are different, different cities are kind of dealing with these issues a different way. But what I would say from a Lyft standpoint is that our, our view is we are far better off like engaging with cities on the front end before these issues become problems for our people and, um, and working out our solutions early on. And I think that's, that's a view that we take as a technology company that's actually on a platform that deals with the real world. That, that makes us different than some of these other tech firms that are more internet only oriented. We know our business affects real people in real, real cities. You know, and I think you're touching on a really important hurdle that, that transportation and all these innovations need to get over, which is trust. 
the idea of um, your privacy is just one component of it. I mean, in Arizona right now, you have residents in Phoenix who are actually slashing tires of driverless cars and throwing rocks at them. They feel so much hostility. Um, there is, you know, that's just one example, but there's a big, and then surveys, several surveys show that there's a general, the majority of people actually don't feel like they would today be comfortable being in a driverless car. Mm -hmm. How do you get over that? When will people get over that? Will they get over that? Anybody? I, I happen to be, um, I'm not sure if anyone here is from um, an, uh, Ashdo, but there is a meeting, a national meeting here for all states state highway and transportation officials at the same time. And um, Secretary Chow actually spoke this morning and she actually shared and echoed many of the things Josh has been saying. But there was a whole session on automated and autonomous vehicles. And the manufacturers are saying, we are ready. We are ready to deploy <laughs> driverless cars. But the truth is most state transportation networks are not quite prepared because of what it's going to take for the standards just in pavement markings and signage and the fiber, the communications network. In Virginia, we have very strong um, communications connections and internet in our urban areas, but it's very interrupted in the rural. You mentioned where you know travel just on Amtrak. Um, so we have to be able to create a very dependable broadband communication system for all of this to work. Um, and so the state's platform is really important to making this happen. And the attitudes and the trust of citizens, it's a huge education piece. But as we're moving forward, much of the automation that is taking place today in your vehicles with um, uh, cruise control, collision alerts, warning signals, uh, is all, it's you know, vehicle to vehicle data transmission that is working really well, that's actually helping to make driving safer, we hope. Um, there, all of this is actually helping us with safety and mobility. Um, in Virginia, we just announced a vehicle to infrastructure program with Audi where they are actually, they're using our data, 1400 signals in Northern Virginia, to be able to communicate to their cars on time to green, you'll be at a light, let you know when you can go. Because of the waste of time, people are looking at their phones, they're distracted, let you know when you can go. But another system where in the car, it'll tell you what speed you can drive and continue in a green band through a quarter so you don't hit a red light. Just all these things that we're able to do, it's not driverless, but this is all how automation can help the capacity of our quarters, which are often very limited, the safety and the mobility. So I think yeah. it's going to be a transition. You know, I, I agree. And did yeah. the secretary say she would support the tunnel, by the way, this morning? Um. <laughs> I got her number. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> The, I, I agree. The technology is incredible, and I think we, were, you know, in, in the House last Congress, we passed a yeah. uh, you know, piece of legislation so we could actually avoid 50 patchworks. It didn't get out of Senate, but we're. I think we have to keep trying, and I think there is a lot of anxiety, as you point out, Celia. Right? People are worried about safety, and when you when you read about these incidents, we should be worried about it, and we we have to think them through in the front end. Otherwise, you'll ruin all the progress, right? If you don't, but you but but progress always is bumpy, and, and so is every innovation. We just have to make sure that we have the guardrails in place so that people are thinking them through ahead of time on safety and, and utilizing this incredible, right? I mean, we all love innovation technology. I mean, a lot of us love innovation and technology and see the incredible opportunities in it, but also you've got to think, you have to think through what could happen and the ifs and whats as much as you can up front and not just show up and say, I hope this all works out. Right. Yeah, you know, kudos to the Department of Transportation right now. They're reaching out to companies like ours and getting us involved in helping them understand what's the art of the possible, what's the, what is going to be the regulatory uh, framework that needs to be developed for the future. So I think this kind of collaborative cycle is good. But I've got a quick question. I have two grandchildren, ages three and one. How many people in the room think that they will ever get a driver's license? Mm. Show of oh, hands. Yeah, no way. That's wow. very few, very few yeah. hands. Hmm. Wow. Yeah. So a totally shared and autonomous future. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Um, today, oh. Lyft's platform, 30% of our trips right now are shared trips, and we hope to get to 50% by 2020. Uh, but on this autonomous point, if I could uh, yes. make one <laughs> final uh, point there, is there's also a huge opportunity for safety um, yeah, right. And I think it's worth talking about mm. the fact that more than 90% of 
our accidents on the road today have to do with human factors. And that may be everything from distracted driving, impaired driving, not wearing seat belts, et cetera, et cetera. So the possibility that we could eliminate, as some experts believe, up to 80% of the accidents that occur today is a huge game changer. Now the reality, I want to sort of put a little, I told you within 10 years you might have access to an autonomous vehicle. That doesn't mean that they're going to be rolling around every street corner in America. It usually takes about 25 years for a new innovation in, t in transportation technology to actually deploy uh, in a way that you would consider ubiquitous. And so we have a long time before we, we, we see like full deployment, if you will, of, of that technology, but the opportunity to improve safety is profound. Mm -hmm. And are you using big data? If you want to ask, how is, you know, it's a, yeah. I, I see it in rail. We know where we've got some legislation through to use all the data so we can make rail travel safer. Mm -hmm. And so when something's going right, they can slow down and know that's been a problem yes. around the bend. Yeah. And Absolutely. obviously we'll do that with vehicles. How is the, is that something you all are thinking about? Uh, Sorry, yeah. I just want to like, uh, well, ask. Yeah, sure. and, and Siemens is working is on answer? multiple sides of this problem. Did you want to move to a different no, thing? No, no, please. Um, so um, just think about what the car manufacturers need to do today. How would you go through testing out a vehicle when you know that it's getting ready for autonomous driving as opposed to meeting the specs for an mm -hmm. automobile that a human will drive? It turns out that um, we've actually, we actually have software that creates a simulated environment that allows the, the computer programming of the automobile to be tested out for millions of driving hours you know, in an artificial environment. So we can make the digital twin of what the automobile will actually experience, and by doing that, be able to affirm the safety of the systems. Now, being able to learn through big data about best practices from elsewhere, all that, those are all the potential applications. We've got to get there. And can I just add that, you know, from your perspective, gathering all this data from, you know, private manufacturers, you, we at the state level in Virginia, we opened this open portal, an open data portal where people can actually sign in and look at tra um, traffic patterns, um, road conditions, crash data. So you can get all this information and we work with private industries so that we can anticipate problems and solve problems and try to be a catalyst for some of these decisions. But the collaboration, that really, I think, is how we are going to move this forward. It's going to take government and private industry and our university partners, I think, really, to help this um, uh, create a safer, more mobile, more seamless transportation system. Mm -hmm. And Barbara, maybe you can give us a sense of what's going on globally. You're the CEO of Siemens USA, but Siemens is a big global corporation. Where is the US stack compared to other countries when it comes to the most innovative infrastructure and technology oh, uh, and transportation changes? Yeah, I Actually, and look for us at the Dubai Expo because we're the digital partner for that. You know, so we'll be able to see some of the technology, some of the best in the world at work in a, in a beautiful showcase. Are you inviting all of us? <laughs> what do you say? <laughs> um, but you'll hear a lot about, um, and, and I think a lot of what's going on globally is is really coupled with what's going on in the energy landscape. I keep coming back to this, but the fact is that, think of this, we're in a, this highly developed region with plenty of power. There are other parts of the world where they're just now getting access to power. And what they're doing is choosing a leapfrog methodology. Um, China right now is the number one user of electric vehicles. As an example, you know, there are entire fleets of electric buses going around major cities yeah. in China now. Whereas, you know, in New York, for instance, we've just begun to experiment with those first few vehicles. Um, I think that um, between that marrying of, of the power required to drive all of this, and then, of course, the technology that's within, whether it's transportation or whether it's in the connectedness of systems within cities. Um, all of that is just on the cusp of being invented. Now, if any of you go to Munich and choose to go to a Bayern Munich football game, what you'll see is that Siemens is the digital partner there. And you can see examples of what it's like to have a sports experience really augmented with, with, with data that is going to help you enjoy the experience more, get there faster, get out faster, etc. Mm. So, you know, you would imagine in the, in the developed world, 
countries that are taking a very progressive view in terms of what technologies they want to bring are having a heyday with all of this. Yeah, there's, um, here's an interesting data point. China has built 16,000 miles of high-speed rail in 20 years. The first phase of California's high-speed rail project, 119 miles through the Central Valley, won't be completed until 2022. This is just such a stark comparison. What's at stake here, Anthony? Uh, well, it's <laughs> <laughs> uh, billions of dollars uh, at the moment. Uh, we, you know, look, I think the U.S. struggles, is, as I've pointed out earlier, with doing big things right now because we're in this spaghetti bowl of decision making. Um, if you've got the administration, the governor, the local folks agreeing, you can get something done. But different election cycles, different administrations changes the equation. And California right now is seeing uh, a difference in the Obama administration versus the Trump administration on, on the high-speed rail question. What's at stake for you as citizens and as people who who live in this country and who need to move around is what I said earlier, which is you have high growth areas that have traditionally been stuck with the automobile. And when I say stuck with the automobile, what I mean is if that's our main source of getting around in the future and our only source of getting around in places that are highly uh, congested, we're gonna, be, we're gonna have a big problem. Places like California need transportation options. Um, places like Florida, Texas, and other places need transportation options, Virginia. Um, but those are places that you know, weren't early in building subways, weren't early in building mass transit, and so they're playing catch up and there are few tools to do that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the federal government has a responsibility to help these areas figure this out because otherwise travel times are gonna go up, the cost of moving goods and other things is gonna go up. But you, all, but you also, just a quick point on that, so yes, you've got newer places that are growing now and mm -hmm. so they don't have, they're adding roads for the first time in these places mm -hmm. so their roads are brand new, right? And then you have legacy places that roads go back to the Second World War and lots mm -hmm. of, right, bridges and tunnels uh, mm -hmm. that, that are, are need help yep. and you can't just we can't not invest in those because literally you'll shut down the economies in the regions that our, you know, our economy depends on the growth and, and the ability to get around. So how do you, how do yeah. you manage new technology with that and actually fixing the old? So it's funny, I, I was in a congressional hearing once where I was asked about our investment in transit. And I got asked by members of Congress from the South why we wanted to put so much money in transit because it was all going to go to the northeast it was all going to go to the midwest mm -hmm. and the problem is it's not either or you know right. in fact though you know to the extent they reduce the amount of money in the transit it actually ends up hurting those growth areas as much as it hurts those areas that need the deferred maintenance dollars so i don't think it's either or but you know the the other problem and i'll stop telling you all of the little uh small stuff but the transportation policy people know this is a big problem, but we all have to go to Senate Finance and to House Ways and Means, and they've got lots of problems around how to raise money and invest money. Um, and so you almost can't do transportation policy correctly without also having strong advocates on those committees because they're the ones that actually feed the, the revenue streams. But your point was exactly right before, that you've got to pull back away from the, the, po the politics of this stuff, the, right? The obstructionism, whether for whatever reason it's there at every yeah. level, the yeah. bureaucracy and the red tape gets in the way of doing what we need to do yeah. to actually fix the problem. Yeah. And you know, if we allow that to keep going, you, you just can't keep punting here, right? And, that, and that's, that's the crisis we're facing right now. Why, why should, out of every dollar in the highway trust fund, just as an example, why should on a formula, should we spend 80% on roads and 20% on transit? Right. What if we just said to states, states, we want you to reduce congestion, improve the environment, right. ensure communities that have historically been underserved are served properly, make sure your public input's proper. And however you get there, you get there. That would be like a major improvement. And in I will tell you from a state perspective, we would love that. <laughs> Well, because we realize that you cannot build enough roads to actually address all the issues with safety and congestion and connectivity. What we have really learned 
um, in our large urban areas is that it does require those multimodal connections. When you look at 66, 495, 95, what we're trying to do as we are, we're not actually building new roads, we're trying to transform the roads that we have, trying to increase capacity, but as we do that, we have to make the investments in Metro. We have to create mm -hmm. more VRA, and we're working on ways to do it where we, we could perhaps have um, far more um, trains and connect with Maryland, with the MARC system, and with transit and buses, and it, it, is, it requires it, it's a must that we have this multimodal platform. So from a state perspective, ha being able to solve problems like that, I think makes it far more efficient, far more effective, and far more cost effective as, as well. I will just say that that same reasoning works in rural Virginia, rural Absolutely. areas as well. Right. When I'm talking about when you, the multimodal connections, it, it, when we were working on Metro and we're trying to get buy-in, over the last five years, 72 new, 72% um, of all new businesses looking at Northern Virginia wanted to be within a half a mile of a metro station. Now, today, 100% of all new business wants to be within a half mile of a metro station. And it's because their workforce wants to be able to have access, easy accessibility to whether it's rail or transit or being able to walk. That's what consumers want. You talk about your children, are they going to be able to do that? In rural areas, that kind of thinking is really just as important. Um, I live, my home is in um, Lynchburg, Virginia. I have an apartment in Richmond. And we did a regional connectivity study looking at eight modes of transportation, one being digital, of how important internet connection is in a region <clears throat> like that. But having those multimodal connections is, is so important because that is where the millennials, entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. new people, they want to live in places where you have access to an Amtrak station or transit services or a trolley or micro transit or being ha having the ability to ride a bike to work. Or lift. Or <laughs> I was saving. I was saving that for my finality. Well, it's true in the suburbia. Everyone wants to have access to lift. But but they it do. also That's opens right. up where people can live That's and right. work. That's and true. so that kind of thinking, that multimodal connectivity, smart economic decisions, I think matters across the spectrum. I would love to open up the um, the forum to questions. We're going to have actually two mics on the side. So as we set up, I'm going to ask one quick question. As we sort of set up, you can. Go to um, one of the mics here or there. I think we're going to have another one. Before we get to that, really fast. Okay, how are you, Anthony, at Lyft? And maybe you could speak for your whole industry. What are you going to do about the drivers of the future? Are you going to replace them? Are you thinking about jobs going forward? Yeah, I mean, great question. As I said before, I think we, we are, first of all, on an inevitable march towards autonomous vehicles, but in our business, um, you know, we see plenty of opportunity for human beings to be part of not only the transition, but really that ultimate future. And, um, you know, with a 25 year or more, you know, turnover, as you, as you might imagine, um, in the fleet, and I mean the national fleet of cars, <clears throat> not just ours, um, I think, I think the future is bright for, for human beings to be around not only our business, but, but lots of other businesses. Now, how that, how that plays out um, will be the subject of a lot of conversation in both the public and private sector, but uh, we don't see in the near to medium term any, any uh, shortage of opportunity mm. for drivers. That needs to get fixed because that's why there's a lot of anxiety yeah. uh, about the tech industry. Sure. Please, go ahead. Oh, oh uh, thank continue. you. Um, just a quick, can you just introduce yourself if you don't oh, mind? Um, yeah. I'm uh, Carter McLeod. I live in D.C. Um, and it's so funny. I cannot see you at all. Really? <laughs> in that light. Because of yeah, the light. Like you're just a shadow. I'm, I'm just a me. silhouette. Yeah. I'm like a, a mob informant on the local news. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, just, to, uh, just to preface this uh, question, uh, you're all in a leadership position. Great leaders are usually judged by the change that they... Uh, introduced, you know, presidents uh, Lincoln with the 13th Amendment, LBJ with Medicare. They, they 
produce change. And they also uh, have to do so, I don't know if you saw the movie Lincoln, by pushing hard. Lincoln famously dragged people all around Congress into elevators bodily. Um, Secretary Fox, you said more federal control. That involves somebody powerful going to states and saying no. You know, states saying, I want all of my transportation, to, I want control of that, saying, no, we're going to manage this tunnel project. Um, uh, a community in somebody's district in New Jersey says, we don't want this tunnel construction next to our house. It's noisy. And you, as a congressperson, have to say, I'm sorry, tough. The rest of the region needs it. Um, who's going to Let's step it. <laughs> Who's going to step up? Uh, yeah. Who's going to step up and say, uh, we're going to make a fundamental change? Because I, I don't, in 500 years, I don't know if, you know, these the state municipal patchwork is even going to exist. Mm -hmm. And somebody's going to step up and change that and streamline it. So uh, three answers to your question. First, um, I don't think every transportation project should be federalized, but I do yeah. think that in the unique category of freight, there's a good argument for a national program that's driven by the federal government to to do things like the Columbia River Bridge project between Washington and Oregon, for example, that got sideways because of changes in elections and so forth. Those projects are urgent and they're all over the country and I think it would be helpful to have that. The second point is that um, this country has a very ugly history of mowing over low income and poor and minority communities to get projects done. And I believe very strongly that we need to rethink the way we do public input. Um, and by that, what I mean is uh, instead of saying, hey, come to the government center at three o'clock and have a public input hearing on some project, and we're probably going to do it anyway, but, you know, just come and tell us what you think. Uh, we need to have a different reset on the, on the bureaucratic end of this. And that means going out to communities where people are talking in language that they understand, not transportation speak and actually trying to, to solve problems. The third point I would make is that um, uh, the states and the cities, I think the organizing principle of transportation has been too jurisdictionally focused. So if you look at a map of the country's mega regions, there are actually 13 of them around the country and they're concentrated, they actually go beyond state borders in some cases, they go beyond city borders in some cases. And that should become an organizing principle for how we think about how to push money local. So I would love to see, for example, Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia extend the Northeast Corridor down south because that's where a lot of growth is going. Mm -hmm. But they've got to come together and do that. And so we have these opportunities that we're not seizing because we haven't actually pushed that conversation at the federal level. Great. Thank you. Next question. Um, I'm Abigail Woodward. I also live in D.C. And um, I'm interested in privacy. And I'm wondering, uh, can you like, have your trip erased off of the data from an autonomous vehicle or your children's uh, you know, trip if they're on there, if you don't want people to know where your children are going? And um, also, I heard that, uh, that in like Saudi Arabia and some other countries, that um, men have control over the access of the women being able to apply for like visas or passports or something. And I, I would hope that we wouldn't have any kind of um, like uh, uh, supervision over, uh, over people being able to, to book you know, trips one place or the other, anything like that. I don't you know, anticipate we're gonna be like that. But the privacy issue is, is pretty important to mm -hmm. me. And I had one other concern which was um, I was following closely the, the uh, PPP and, and I think that the um, Infrastructure Development Bank was a good idea. Whatever happened with that? Let's just take the, is, is, there, is privacy even a big discussion right now when it comes to people's data? Um, I feel, I mean, people's data when it comes uh, in the future transportation, I actually feel like it's secondary tertiary when I have conversations. I mean, the toll roads, you know, they, well, they'll, they'll take pictures them. of It, it yeah. may be for the yeah. moment, but it's going to yeah. bubble right to the surface. Yeah, I, yeah. I, sorry, go ahead. I was just going to say it's a significant topic, whether it's people's credit data, we had a hearing on it this week, or data related to any kind of big data assets, you know, and, or social media data, that is a, a significant topic for people because 
you know, there's so much exposed. And I think how we deal with this, we want to make sure that we can take advantage of what's going on in innovation technology, but not at, not at the cost of people's personal data. Mm -hmm. I, I'll just speak as someone who, uh, who was part of an administration when the OPM information was, was pulled up in China. Uh, somebody in China has got my personal data. Um, and that's a cautionary tale as we think about these situations, even with cities, um, right. where you know we're incentivized as a company to maintain the privacy of those who use our services, but if that information, even aggregated information, is turned over to a less secure system, then it becomes uh, potentially exposed. So these yeah. issues are very thorny, and yeah. I think we'll spend a lot of time trying to solve them over, over okay. time. Absolutely. Next question, please. Hi, I'm Bob, and I uh, just want to preface uh, saying that I'm learning uh, about all of this stuff and um, want to make sure that uh, if I ha any of my assumptions are incorrect, just let me know. Um, I know if people love their personal vehicles and freedom. Any thought on reducing that, uh, that added traffic to interstates and maybe encourage people, more people to work at home, maybe incentivize working at home by uh, traveling? Um, I'll, I'll take it just a, a stab at this. Um, our policy, the overarching policy that we have in the Commonwealth is we want to move the greatest number of people at the lowest possible cost. We're not in the business of just moving cars. It used to be we've been moved cars. Now we're really trying to move people. So there is a shift. And so when um, Outside 66 was being um, developed, the idea for it, there were more than 350 meetings, community meetings, school meetings, getting input. It was really from that that we learned how important the multimodal perspective was, which is why in the contracts for both inside and outside 66, part of the highway contract, contract included funding for transit, um, for park and rides. We built that into the highway contract. Um, and in fact, it's a part of the program over the life of the, um, the lease of the roadway. And it was really through that that the policy in Virginia was that transit would be free. So if you're on a bus, you don't pay. If you are a carpool, you don't pay. Um, right now on Inside 66, it's HOV2, and then once we connect it with outside, it'll be HOV3. But in the, it's been a year since Inside 66 opened. Um, carpooling has gone up. Two-thirds of the riders on 66 do not pay a toll because they're carpooling and riding transit, um, which in, in the year... Uh, has translated in the number of just of carpoolers taking 2,000 cars a, a day off peak hour driving. So it is a way, I think, of partnering with citizens to figure out what is important, how can we move as many people, and so that's how the policies actually evolved. Thank you. Next now, we can do more, and it's building on that, Thank but you. it really is building that kind of thinking into transportation planning. Thank you for your question. Thank you for your question. So it seems that the panel wants to expand public transportation, and the reason for that is, at least in part, is to help the environment. So if we have a huge investment into public transportation, is that going to have a massive effect on our total carbon emissions? Mm, great question. Yeah, our data shows <coughs> excuse me, that the transportation sector is responsible for something like have I got my numbers right? 40% of carbon emissions. It's, it's a huge contributor today to carbon. And so this idea of converting from fossil fuel powered transportation into electric transportation is really compelling. Next question, please. Hi. Um, just uh, actually touching a bit on a, a prior question as well. Um, but since a lot of you folks are deploying technologies and um, sort of proactively launching these efforts. I'm curious if there are sort of proactive approaches to being privacy protective in some of these either pilots uh, or programs that uh, you've been thinking about from the outset that you could maybe speak to. Um, I will, um, from our perspective, you know, the issue of data, data governance, data security is just a huge part of everything that we're doing. I could not answer the woman's particular question about whether or not the trip could be saved or deleted from GPS, but it's an issue that we are 
looking at today, we're actually looking at the data that's within transportation. And if you think of DMV, um, it's a tremendous amount of data. So we try to keep everything as secure as possible, but we are partnering with the administration from looking at the entire Commonwealth. It's an ongoing process. Um, but I agree, I think privacy is going to become more and more of an issue. I think, and I think you raised, you touched on a very important point. Who owns the data? If you are in that car, whoever happens to provide your ride, Lyft, Uber, whatever company towards the future, who owns that data? And what how, kind of control do you have in the future? I mean, I would actually argue that that discussion is so nascent right now um, on the federal Great. level that, and it's going to be, it's going to be a big mess. And I think also the tech companies, and I don't want to, I'm getting a little preachy now, but the tech companies, if you don't, if you, if one ignores these problems, it'll only feed into this growing anxiety about how technology is really not putting the interests of consumers first. And, you know, and we, oh, we, there you are. Yeah. <laughs> no, and we see this, right, you see uh, with the, the, all these credit bureaus last year with Equifax and what happened when all the data got people's personal data, yeah. right, got tapped, right, at least 140 million people's personal data was released, and the anxiety it creates and the reality of the impact it has on your life. So I think this has to be part of the upfront conversation, whether you mm -hmm. are Lyft or any other company, thinking through where does this data go, how do we maximize it so you can use it in, in Virginia or in the great state of Jersey, how do we make sure we use it, put it to good use um, for efficiency purposes and safety purposes, but also not compromise people's you know, privacy. I, th I think it has to be thought through. So when I set up the Office of Innovation, that is one of the core areas that we're actually focusing on with that. It's privacy. Great. Next question, please. Hi, my name is Evan. Uh, I have the good fortune of being able to walk to work here in DC. Oh, the best. <laughs> Lucky. <laughs> but that brings up a question. Tonight when I was coming to this event, um, I was looking at how to get here and I pulled up my Google app and uh, looked at a bus and then looked at the transportation options and I had about 10 minutes to get out of the house to catch the bus to then make a transfer to another bus. Um, I then missed that bus, obviously. So, what kind of partnerships or what kind of collaboration is there or are there between private corporations like Lyft and uh, public entities like WMATA um, or other organizations in order to facilitate this movement across the multimodal systems? Um, and what does it look like now and what could it look like in the future? So um, we are doing a lot of experimentation here. Um, we have a, a function on our app that we are, are using called Transit Nearby. And you can actually go on the Lyft app in certain places. We haven't rolled it out everywhere yet, but you can actually pick up like where the bu next bus is coming or the next transit trip is coming on our app. I think um, that's, a, that's an awesome uh, uh, thing to have uh, our company do. So I could scoot to the, uh, the next transit. <laughs> <Yeah. trip. laughs> you could scoot, you could uh, bike, you could get a lift ride to the bus stop. You know, there's lots of ways you could do it. Um, and so I think these, you know, I think the, the goal is that we need to have an ecosystem that's robust that gives you maximum choices and you can, ma you can sort of rationalize your decision, whether it's you want to save time, you want to save money, sometimes <coughs> those things are the same, sometimes they're different. And um, that's kind of, I think, where, where we're headed. Putting my mayor's hat on for a second, um, one of the other secrets of transportation is that transit doesn't pay for like it doesn't the fare box does not pay for the services that people use in transit and i actually think there are going to be ways over the longer term where public and private can come together to offload some of that operational deficit on the public side but improving the level of service on the consumer and the passenger side and i, I think we should engage in those conversations as public and private sector. Thank you very well, much. We look forward to that. And I am so sorry we ran out of time. This has been such a, a wide-ranging conversation. I'm sorry about thank that. You. Thank Can you, you please thank our panelists? <coughs> thank Shannon you. Valentine, Josh Gottheimer, Barbara Humpton, and Anthony Fox. Thank you so thank much you. for coming thank out this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was great.